Welcome to Loom Shop. My name is Eric. So a week ago, I posted on Instagram, the YouTube community, and on my Facebook page that I'll be doing a short Q&A segment towards the end of one of my next videos. Now, I didn't expect that many comments to go through or questions, but I was overwhelmed with the response that you guys gave me. So instead of making just a short segment towards the end of one video, I found it reasonable to make a dedicated Q&A video. So I have my phone up right here with all the questions and I'll be getting through most of them one by one. Now I do apologize if I don't get through every single question. I would really love to, but it would make for a really long video. So let's get started. This is one of my most asked questions. Um, it's by Nathan Barnes and he asked, where do you source your OEM Seiko parts? So we all know where to get aftermarket parts for the most part, but original parts has always been a problem, I guess, for most of us guys, especially the people who are just starting in uh, watch modding. Now there's a couple ways to get original Seiko parts. I'll just go through the three ways that I get mine. So the first one is parts that are left over from other builds. So let's say I'm using a Seiko 5 and I really don't need the handset. I wouldn't just discard those, I would save them just in case I needed a specific type of handset for the future. So the first one is to get parts from existing Seiko models. The second one, which is probably the most important one, is to find a retailer watchmaker with a Seiko parts license. So individuals like us can't directly get these parts from Seiko, but some stores with these licenses are able to get in parts directly from Seiko. It's important to develop a relationship with these uh, licensed stores so that they give you the ability to purchase the parts from them. Whether it be a physical store or an online vendor, it doesn't hurt to ask if they're able to get these original parts. And lastly, it will be forums, eBay, Facebook groups, all of those stuff. People do post parts for sale, you just gotta search the right groups. But you do have to be careful with eBay because recently there has been a splurge of counterfeit or fake parts that are being listed as real. So it's not that much of a problem if these aftermarket parts are labeled aftermarket and are priced appropriately, but some of the not so reliable sellers are calling these authentic parts and charging full price for non-authentic parts. Now the second question is by Leisure777, how can I buy that watch? So this question is referring to the picture that I posted on my YouTube community page when I originally posted the uh, Q&A video release. The picture was on the Loom Master 300 and I did a full feature video on that. You can check out the video by clicking the link right there somewhere. And so I did have two of these LM300s for sale and both of them did find nice homes. But if you guys see any watch on my channel or my Instagram or Facebook that you would like to buy or have one built for yourself, you can just shoot me an email and I can let you guys know the availability of it. Most of the models that I make are open for commission, so if you do want it, I can most likely have it made for you. So the next question is by Joseph Stewart. In your humble opinion, how much should you spend on a beginner's modding toolkit for your first build? So the amount you spend on tools for the first time can be a large or a small range. Personally, I wouldn't recommend you buy the most expensive tools when you're first starting out. When I first started, I got the cheapest tools available to me. And the total is most likely going to be $100 to $200, more likely towards the $200 point. It's always best to start off with the more affordable tools to see if this modding thing is right for you. I started with the inexpensive tools, but gradually I upgraded my tool collection to get more expensive ones or better calibrated ones. So this question is by Oscar Schiff and it's kind of tied into the previous question. He asks, do you have a list of tools you would recommend? And I actually do. I have an Amazon affiliate link and so any purchase you make through that link, I get a small commission from that. But I do have lists there for watchmaking tools. If you look through the page, you see two watchmaking tool lists and the first one is a complete list of all the tools, so ranging from beginner to intermediate to advanced tools. And there's a dedicated list just for beginner modding tools. So these are going to be the more inexpensive tools and tools that I would recommend if you're trying to just start off this modding thing. In the list, you should be able to find all the tools you need to get started in watch modding or making, such as hand movers, hand presses, uh, screwdrivers, tweezers, crystal presses, and so on. And so the next question is by Jennifer St. Louis. Eric, where such how did you learn your watchmaking skills? So I started watchmaking or modding around two, three years ago, probably three years ago by now. And at the time, there was no watch modding community. You could rarely find any groups, if 
any at all about the Seiko modding thing and so I had a really difficult time starting out. As a result, I had to refer to watchmaking books and videos and classes. So Dr. George Daniels watchmaking book is an incredible resource, not necessarily for basic watch modding, it's more about the actual making process of a watch and parts. But it is an incredible resource that is worth the read if you have the time. Another resource that I used were online classes or physical classes such as the Horological Society of New York. They have classes available if you are in the New York area. And I also participated in a couple of JOC master watchmaking classes so that really helped kickstart my curiosity, my interest, and my skills in this watchmaking thing. Nowadays, it's a lot easier to learn how to watch mod. I have a bunch of tutorials online and the reason why I uploaded those videos is because I wish I had those videos available to me when I first started. I was hoping to foster or to grow the community so that I can interact with more people with the common interests as me. Thankfully today, we have large groups on Facebook, on Reddit, and on YouTube about watch modding which makes this whole hobby a lot more enjoyable. The next question is by Zach S. How does a typical build job begin? Do the customers usually know what they want exactly? Or do you brainstorm with them before? How exactly do you present the options for them? And how is a final build determined? So if you guys didn't know, I do offer watch modding or making services. And typically when customers email me, because I do work on an email basis since all of these orders are commissioned. So they are made exactly how the customer wants it to be made. And there are a couple of types of customers. The first type knows what he wants. He knows what parts are available, where to get them. And so they have everything planned out beforehand and they just need me to build the watch for them. The second customer doesn't know what he really wants. He's unsure, but he knows he wants a custom Seiko. So what I usually do is I refer these customers to my Instagram page where I usually post most if not all of the customer builds I've ever done. By looking through these pictures, they can draw inspiration and try to determine what they want for their own build. And that's the reason why I post all of these specifications for these builds in the description of the Instagram post. There are also customers who know what type of watch they want but aren't sure of the specific parts. That's when I like to make recommendations. So if they were going for a diver style watch, I would recommend an oyster style bezel with a diver bezel insert in ceramic, a double dome sapphire crystal in blue or clear AR generally, and some diver dial and handset. So I can make all the recommendations whether it's starting from scratch, so using a custom case for the build, or using an existing Seiko SKX for the build itself. So usually it's brainstorming between the customer and myself to find out uh, what the customer really wants. So upon determining the final breakdown of the build, I provide a quote, the customer pays the quote, and I buy the materials, and the build process begins after that. So the next question is by Jason Ho. Great videos, you've inspired me to build slash mod my own watches. What are your thoughts on fashion watches? Happy holidays. I hope you have a great holiday, and a couple of my friends, or a lot of my friends and peers, have fashion watches, and I don't really recommend them, but if you already bought one, that's great because the most important thing is you got a watch on your wrist. And that's the main thing that I'm trying to stress to all the people around me. Get a watch on your wrist, get a feel for it, and then if you like it, you will naturally research more about watches. And hopefully through your research, you won't buy another fashion watch, but you'll buy a decent watch like a Seiko or an Orient or even a micro brand watch because some of these micro brands are offering incredible value for the money with a lot of features that you typically won't find in watches that are offered by these big brands. So fashion watches itself, the physical construction isn't that good and I don't really like them but the whole idea of getting a watch on someone's wrist is something that I do appreciate about these fashion watches. The next question is by 2 Minimoto. What do you think the best starting watch is and your thoughts on the Seiko Turtles? I would lean towards Seiko, Casio, Timex because there are a ton of brands these days that are releasing mechanical watches at great prices. And something that I've been thinking about these days is recommending microbrand watches to people who are looking for their first timepiece. So it is a lot of money to drop two, three, four hundred dollars on a watch. But from the start, you're getting a really well constructed watch, which 
will captivate their interest more than some poorly made fashion watch. They can somewhat understand more why we're so obsessed with these things. The fit, feel, and finish of these Macbrand watches are really good these days, and something like Zellos, like the one I have right here, I'm going to be viewing it really soon, is a fantastic watch. And the last part of the question is my thoughts on the Seiko Turtle. So the Turtle is really funny because it's a 44mm watch, but it doesn't wear like a 44. The watches were a lot smaller than what their dimensions suggest. And I think that's mostly due to the smaller dials and the shorter lug to lug distance. But in terms of aesthetics, I don't like the Turtle as much as the traditional SKX style case. It's a great watch, but just something that I'm not interested in aesthetically. So the next question is by RGONZ63FUL. Perhaps a summary of the evolution of Seiko divers, pros, cons of each, and what we might be seeing coming out of both your workshop and Seiko's. Keep up all the great work and looking forward to more great content from you in 2020. Happy holidays. Thank you so much for the kind words. I really do appreciate it and happy holidays to you. So. A summary of the evolution might be a really long video, so maybe I'll save that for another time. But what you can expect coming out of my workshop is a lot of more custom builds. So both high-end and mid-tech watches, I'm going to start calling them. So mid-tier watches, I'm going to be using some really nice designs that I've been coming up with and working with parts providers in case they want to sponsor the builds like Crystal Time Serology and the Mokis. As you guys probably have noticed, I'm focusing more on making designs, so custom pieces, that I felt like Seiko should have released themselves. So that means all of the parts have to flow with each other really well so that it looks like a natural watch. So it doesn't look like someone took out the hands and replaced them with aftermarket ones. I'm also gonna continue to show the new parts that these parts providers are making for us. And you guys can also expect to see the reviews and feature videos that I've been doing. In terms of what Seiko might be putting out, I'm not really sure, I haven't been following their posts too long. Um, I think there's a couple of limited edition dials or special edition dials that are coming out early 2020 for the Turtle I believe, so we can look out for that. So this question is from Instagram and this is a really long username so I'll just include you in the uh, capture right here. But he asked, have you noticed a difference in tolerances in the bezel action between one watch to another? I've replaced bezels and had them turn as crisp as ever and had others just feel loose and cheap. So there definitely is a tolerance difference between some parts, especially with the bezel click spring. So all of the parts won't have exactly the same action. So if your bezel was clicky and nice and snappy when it had the original rotating bezel on, but suddenly it felt a little bit looser and not as snappy when you had an aftermarket one, it all depends on the tolerances of how these parts are manufactured. But what's important to know is that the tolerances of these bezels can be adjusted whether it's changing out the o-ring size or manually adjusting the shape of the bezel click spring. I typically found that you can get bezels to operate close to each other if you adjust one of the two things that I've said. Okay, so that was a lot of questions and I would love to get through more, but I really think this is a long video, so I'll stop it right here. I want to thank everybody who submitted a question for this Q&A video and I'm sorry if I couldn't get to yours. Let me know if you guys want to see more Q&A videos. I think it's really fun and it gives me a chance to directly interact with you guys. So 2019 has been a great year for this channel and I really want to thank all of my supporters, whether it's on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and especially the customers who have placed custom orders with me. It really does amaze me that you guys trust me to build these incredible pieces for you and I couldn't do any of this without you guys' support. The orders that come in really do help the channel grow and allows me to put out more content for you guys and the funds allow me to buy more camera gear, lighting, watchmaking tools, and also allows me to make more build videos that you guys seem to be enjoying. So I wish you all a happy holidays and a great new year. You guys can expect a build video coming Coming up in early 2020. I did a special build video for my father as a Christmas gift so that should be a pretty cool. Oh also I made a Facebook page and if you guys can stop over there and give it a like or a comment or a follow I would really appreciate it. It's at Loomshot. And that's about it. If you haven't already please subscribe to the channel, give this video a thumbs up, click the bell icon to be notified when I release a new video and I hope you guys have a nice day.